the app is actually one. Uh, the second challenge um, is actually um, to ensure that different systems can recognize consistently the same student so that we don't get confused. And here I want to show you this diagram and I heartfully apologize for bringing this up. I know this is, looks complicated and it should be intended for, you know, the advanced webinar for those of you who have a PhD in Erasmus without paper. But here, what I want to point out is just the fact that uh, with all these universities exchanging uh, student data, what we want to make sure is that the same student is recognized in all the universities. There is no confusion. So the student going from the university of Porto to Ghent University to Warsaw can be consistently recognized as the same student. So even if there is a student that is very similar to that student going abroad on mobility, we can tell them apart, even if they are identical twins by birth. So there should be a unique way to identify them electronically. And finally, the third challenge is a forward looking one. Uh, this has to do with further development. If we want to allow all this digital infrastructure uh, to enable new functionalities with time, we need to get additional information about the students beyond their student stages. And one example is, for instance, the university that they are coming from. And, and here, I think uh, the easiest example is uh, we have a university, uh, right? A student there who's very excited about going abroad mobility, bouncing around all the time, uh, wants to know where to go. And he's also, or she's also pretty, pretty uh, excited about using uh, the Erasmus app. And I'm getting some annotation requests. I'm going to move them to my other screen. Uh, please keep on annotating things. Oh, okay. Uh, I suppose I'm going to prove it. Okay. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have approved that. Give me a second. I'm going to stop the annotation and I'm going to back to, go back to my screen with the balancing students. I don't know how that is happening. So I'm going to ask you to, in the meantime, just write it down on paper. Uh, so that then you can get back to us, then I'll figure out how to uh, mute those messages or, or block them so that all of uh, you don't have to see them as I move around, uh, along with the presentation. Anyways, let's go back to our university. Let's go back to our student who wants to go abroad mobility, who is very eager to use Erasmus app to simplify their life. And for the student, there are many possibilities, right? Like uh, their home university has a lot of interinstitutional agreements with a lot of other universities. Um, but the app needs to know exactly uh, which one. So when the student logs into the app, the app should be able to make their life easier by telling that student, okay, according to your university of origin, and that's why it's important that we know that information, uh, you can go to these universities that are not just any universities, but those universities with which uh, your home university has a valid agreement. So that's why knowing additional information beyond a student stages is also very relevant. So we decided to accept the challenge and we started uh, to look around for possible solutions. And we spotted two in the horizon. One uh, about which you're gonna hear a lot more later in this presentation is Educate, which provides uh, federated authentication, basically interconnecting uh, federations, identity federations, and simplifying the access to content for users. The second option that was uh, floating around, uh, you may have heard of, uh, it's a European Student Card Project. The European Student Card Project, uh, back then, uh, it was uh, already putting forward an idea for a unique European student identifier that could help identify students in a unique way. Uh, wherever they went in mobility. On top of that, they also wanted to roll out a uh, consistent European uh, visual identity for all students in Europe uh, to have on their student cards. So out of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, look out, a new project was born, a project co-financed by the Connecting Europe facility of the European Union. And that project is nowadays called My Academic ID. And the basic idea behind this project is to enable a single European electronic identification scheme for higher education. And here, uh, the gist is that students should be able uh, to authenticate their student stages online in a reliable, consistent and safe way and use their academic credentials to access different electronic services 
through a single sign-on, sharing their information only once. Um, now, Academic ID is also looking into synergies uh, with the something called the EIDAS network to allow students as well in the future to use their uh, nationally issued uh, citizen EIDs to enroll at higher education institutions and eventually allow them to link their citizen and student digital identities to simplify things further and to enable a higher level, uh, a higher level of assurance. And I know this is probably the face that you're making right now. You're like, really, guys? Um, I can't really see you. Uh, so that's why I had to come up with all these emoticons uh, to also help myself a little bit feel a little bit at ease, you know, knowing that there are people behind the screens. Um, my answer is yes, really. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, three main reasons or two main reasons why this is actually the case. The first one is that my academic ID is combining the best elements from the existing digital infrastructure and tools to power the Erasmus tools, uh, in this case, the app, uh, the OLA. Um, this is what the My Academic ID uh, blueprint architecture looks like. And again, uh, here you don't really need to understand right now uh, what all those connections means. I just wanted to show it to you uh, because there are some names there that probably ring a bell. Uh, the dashboard, the Erasmus app, the only agreement, Erasmus without paper. And uh, if there is one takeaway uh, from this slide is that this is a powerful digital ecosystem. The second reason is that uh, my academic ID, uh, it's bootstrapping identification and authentication solutions that used to operate in silos. That means they used to operate vertically. There was no communication between them. And this is just a very uh, simple way of putting it uh, graphically. Uh, you can see there are some of the projects that are part of my academic ID. And what we're building throughout the my academic ID implementation is complementary making sure that both identification and authentication with different levels of assurances, um, of assurance, I'm sorry, um, is available for European students. Um, the one on the far right, that's EADAS. We're not really going to be talking too much about that in this webinar. We'll leave that for another uh, joyous occasion. Um, right now, what I, we wanted to share with you is the idea behind the European Student Identifier. And I just labeled it as 2.0 because um, throughout 2019, uh, what the My Academic ID Consortium focused on uh, in part uh, was defining uh, the standard uh, structure for this European student identifier to make sure that it would be globally unique, persistent, non-targeted, protocol neutral, and data transport neutral. Um, in the My Academic ID technical documentation, you'll be able to find all the details as as to what this European student identifier is. I know that some of you have the necessary technical background, some of you don't. This is also why at the end of the presentation, uh, we're going to break out uh, into Q&A sessions, uh, one of which will focus more on the technical side of the European student identifier, also known as ESI. And the other session will focus more on um, the practical implications for international relations officers and student mobility. In any case, uh, the basic idea behind the European identifier is that it will allow us to identify students reliably, consistently across borders, across universities, and across electronic uh, services. So uh, this is uh, my representation of how this is going to work uh, in practice. And I know that the first question in your mind is, Victor, why is that stick man? so ugly uh, to which i can only answer you should have seen the first stigma if anything if anything has been bootstrapped uh, throughout the micro implementation is this stigma so imagine that this stigma student uh, is using uh, their electronic credentials powered through edugain to access the online agreement at the Rasmus plus mobile app uh, thanks to edugain um, a, a certain uh, student information will be communicated to those tools in a in a reliable way including the last name the last the name the last name of the students the institution where the student uh, studies at the moment the email of the student to enable communication with them and the european student identifier so that way the receiving institution or the institution that receives this information can be certain that the information is accurate that the information is valid and that the information is up to date. 
Um, so remember those challenges uh, that we mentioned at the beginning, how to know that a student is a student, how to consistently identify the same student across different electronic services, and how to go beyond the mere student status. In a sense, if they were uh, in a chest, in a locked chest or in a locked vault, my academic ID would be that key that will help you unlock it and uh, overcome these challenges. Now, um, in your minds, you're probably wondering now, how do we join Educate? What is that? And how can we take advantage of the European Student Identifier that my academic ID is implementing? And for that, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen and I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, Licia Florio from Educate, so she can, uh, sorry, Jeanne, uh, so she can tell you a lot more about uh, the Educate network and how to join. Um, if you allow me, I'm going to uh, go out of my screen and I'm going to find a way to give uh, control back to Graham, or if I can, to Licha directly. Okay, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, uh, yes, I will. While I there give Licha the control. Please do. And I'm going to mute myself. That would be great. Anyway, thank you very much for that input there. And let me give uh, the floor to um, Licha from Giant, who's going to take you through a bit more of the technical part here. So Licha, there you go. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, I'll go on. Okay, I think this works uh, well now. Um, so we're not seeing any sharing at the moment. Oh, really? It says you are sharing your PowerPoint. Um, I, I can see it. Okay, sorry, I've got it here. Yes. Okay, great. Me. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no, it's okay. It's good to double check to be sure. <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, um, th thanks, Victor. A very good in overview, actually, of what we are doing. My name is Licia Florio, together with Christos Canelopoulos. Um, we are the giant counterpart to in, in my academic ID project. Um, so, Victor gave already the bigger picture what we are doing, why we are doing this, and where we want to be. I would like to really briefly go over the how we are going to deploy in the My Academic ID schema. I also note that My Academic ID project, which has been prolonged and will end at the end of this year, uh, is really about preparing the ground. So we are not going to go production. It, it's, it will not be a big bang. We are going to do things together and, you know, taking the time to ensure that everybody can be on board. Um, so how are we going to achieve this? As I said, we are not going for a destruction. We are not going to build from scratch, but we want to leverage existing infrastructures for practical purposes. First of all, because I have already a user base and it took some years to get to where these infrastructure are. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, although the projects are funded by a different unit, it's, however, the same family. They, the great thing is that those are initiatives um, that have been all funded by the European Commission in different uh, uh, fundings. And now it's nice to see how these things are coming together. So on one side, we, uh, want, to, we want to use Edugain which is the academic uh, infrastructure to enable federated access, as uh, Victor says, and this carries out the studentness. So it brings out, it carries out information about the role that somebody has, in this case, the student, uh, within an organization. And in, the, in, in, in due time, we want also to leverage the fact that pers the person is an individual and therefore is associated with a national EAD, which are now being deployed. Um, why do we want to enable federated access? Well, first of all, we want to reduce the number of credentials that uh, uh, students need to have to, uh, for the daily work in general for the purpose of learning, for the purpose of 
uh, doing exams for the purpose of going abroad for Erasmus purposes, because it's much more, it's, 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 it's better to reduce the passwords. It also increases the user experience. And of, of course, we want to integrate this to fit the Erasmus community needs. So, as Victor said, at the moment, there are different silos, so to speak. Uh, each of these uh, services that are used for Erasmus uh, Plus and they are, are going to be digi are, are being digitized at the moment, they all require they are independent services with different credentials. And where do we want to be? As you can see in the picture below, we want to basically bring together the um, um, Edugain and DEDAS together with my academic ID combine and use this for authentication purposes and then transmit the information about the students that is participating in Erasmus together with the credential to all services that are needed to facilitate the Erasmus process and in the future they, they may, we, we can have more services of course. What, does, what are the requirements? Well, in very, very sim simple words here, the requirements for Erasmus services is to know that a person is a person, it exists, but also that the person is affiliated, associated with a university, a home university, and that this person um, and is, uh, is, wishes to go abroad for Erasmus purposes. On the other hand, um, we want to be sure that the same person uh, is recognized um, when the person tries to access multiple services. Of course, it would be really not desirable if I try to access the app and then access another Erasmus application and all of a sudden I appear as two different users. So um, the important part is for the system to understand that I am the same user throughout the process. Uh, just a little bit about Edugain. Why uh, we thought about Edugain? Well, Edugain has been in production now for uh, about 10 years. There are, uh, um, a, as you can see, the map covers pretty much the whole Europe with the exception of one country in Europe, but also it covers other regions. And this is also important because uh, Erasmus uh, is going uh, beyond Europe, even if it's pretty much uh, a, a flagship for, for Europe and it started very, very much as a European initiative. But now uh, the, the, the boundaries are, uh, are being expanded. Uh, what we worked with in the Edugain community for the last 10 years was really to uh, facilitate federated access, but also to improve uh, to, to ensure that security is preserved and also that everything is compliant with G GDPR. And this is something very, very, very important. What we really try to do is to limit the number of information that are disclosure to a service to what is essential for the service to be able to function. Um, and this is in line with uh, uh, the, the, the minimum set of information that a service has to have to, to, to grant access and to, uh, to allow a user to perform whatever action the user has to perform. Um, the, um, we notice also that uh, this makes things really much nicer for the users because they can access more services and also helps institutions because in some cases, an institution doesn't have to have yet another contract with the same service if the service is already available in a domain and contra uh, contractual arrangements have been made elsewhere. How do I know that my institution is in Edugain? I think if you're using federated access, um, and most likely you are using Eduron also, you are also in Edugain. So I think you do know if you are participating in a national federation, at least if you are in charge of the IT system and if you deal with the enrollment of students. But if you don't know, there is a map and there is a URL here. The slides will be online, we'll share the URL where you can access them. If you go to this website, refet.org, 
on the banner there is federations there is a list which is maybe not so handy to go through but there is a map and it's an interactive map so you can zoom in you can go to europe and as i said all countries are covered with the exception of one and you can see where where your country is find your country find your federation and see if your institution is there so if your institution is in Edugain, okay, you will think, okay, great, I'm there, so everything is good, which is true, everything is good, but what we are asking here, as Victor uh, presented, uh, in the context of my academic ID, in order to be able for services to recognize the same user and give the good experience to the user, we um, are, are using the European student identifier. And this is not a new concept. There was already the concept of the European user identifier. We just evolved this to a new version. Uh, and in this new version, we uh, use the SHAC personal unique code. And the reason for that was that SHAC um, attributes or a subset of the attributes in the SHAC schema are already used by uh, the Erasmus community. So we thought this was a nice, um, as uh, little invasive way as possible to um, deploy the new identifier. So we ask the institutions to deploy, to release, uh, to populate the SHAC personal unique code in the way that is indicated by the specifications that are here, but again, the, you will get the URL online, so that the services, the Erasmus services, can get the information about the users, but also the fact that the user is in fact participating in the Erasmus project. Okay, if, what if your university is not, your institution is not in Edugain? What, what What's next? Well, first, there is no need to panic because it could be that your institution is still participating in a federation. It's just not, uh, um, uh, but, but the federation has not released the information via Edugame. If you are in Europe, uh, as you can see, things are uh, look pretty good because we have got things pretty much covered and we can help you to get in touch with your federation, with your national research and education network to get the support that is needed uh, to join national federations. Because um, maybe just a quick uh, uh, detour here, GEANT is the association of the national research and education networks in Europe. So um, in many cases, they are also the operators of the federation. We work very closely with them and we also support uh, um, uh, training if uh, the NRNs wish uh, to get some help on our side. So there, there are possibilities here. What type of support you will be getting? Um, each federation decides uh, how, or has a policy that uh, regulates the participation of other members. So you will be asked to send the policy and you will be required to install a software on your side that's called Identity Provider and that uh, links with your directory <clears throat> and then allows you to benefit from the from federated access. If you are not in Europe, still you can locate your uh, NRMs on the map and you can still um, find the contact there. If you cannot find the contact there, we can still help you to get in touch with them uh, as the federation operators get all together in the referred forum for which I, I used, um, uh, from where the map comes from that I, I mentioned before. So if you have questions, I mean, I know that there is a possibility to put questions on uh, uh, WebEx, but I also uh, open a session here on Slido, so you can put some questions there. I don't know if time-wise we will be able to address all the questions now, but, um, uh, we can certainly look at the questions and also uh, address them in another webinar if there are more um, um, recurrent questions that are there. And this is all I had to say, so I will um, give my screen and microphone back to Graham. Okay, thank you very much, Lucia. Um, 
So I'm going to hand over to uh, Joel Bacalar from the University Foundation now, um, who's going to uh, give us the in next input. Okay, Joel. So coming Thank over to you. you. Good morning, everyone. Um, while I get my screen up and running, uh, uh, big thanks for the colleagues that preceded because truth is I've done pretty much all of the work in terms of explanations. My job here is to try to wrap up a little bit with some conclusions. Uh, Krem, can you see my screen by any chance? We're just seeing a blank screen at the moment. Okay, now we can see individual slides. Okay. Oh, it should be full screen. Seeing black screen right now. <laughs> yeah. All right, it's up and running then. All good. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to try to build that. My I've done up to now. So, Victor walked us through problem identification, solution which you very kindly uh, zoomed in on the implementation of the problem. Now, this is not meant as a technical webinar. I imagine that many of you that are participating are not necessarily IT experts. So, rather than go even deeper, we will zoom out a little bit. It's only as good as what you do with it, what's the practical impact. And so, I will try to bring together some of the examples that were mentioned before of how you will see this impact. I might add that for some of us, this is a new problem, and that's kind of why we need a new solution. Those of you that run systems at your universities, IT systems, you are working within a closed space. There are only so many people that already have permission to it. But digitizing the Erasmus program means that those tools have to clear tools, and it means there are institutions that um, there is an element of novelty and some extent excitement to trying to get this right. Um, I talk about excitement because I actually think that um, when you leave all of the technical work aside, um, it becomes more interesting again, more fun, because it's about challenging your imagination of how you can put this infrastructure to good use. Now, the first question that Victor mentioned that was a challenge that we were working on was identifying, making sure that users are still up. Some of you that have, for example, worked with the online learning agreement, you'll know that sometimes we have issues with stuff and we're not what to do with them. That's because we currently it's easy to get into these tools. And so as part of the rebuild of the online learning agreement and also the Erasmus app, um, the solutions that I'm presenting to you today will be the default solution for higher education students to log a contradict literally a little bit. Of course, that this is a process, and of course, it doesn't happen at night, but we do urge you to get in touch with your IT teams and make sure that you have the capability to use these tools. That's already the case for maybe 80% of the European student population, but we don't want to leave anyone behind. And there's no reason, it's not about cost or complexity, why anybody else should run into issues. So the users of the system will be, as it was pointed out, it will be a student population. Obviously, I'm scoping my remarks to either topic of today's webinar. If you look into different sectors of the Erasmus program, you're going to have necessarily different solutions that are adapted to the respective populations. I see that my sound is a bit rubbish. I apologize for that. I'll approach the screen a little bit more and uh, keep me posted whether it stops. I'm sorry for that. A second point um, has to do with uh, what was mentioned, a once-only principle. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to a website and having to identify yourself or to identify your university and so on and so forth. But every time that we cannot do this in an automatic manner, we essentially risk creeping in. And so what we will see in the near future already is that uh, we can recycle some of this information to make it um, feel 
Okay, I see that uh, some colleagues are having issues. I'm sorry for that. But I'll have to continue. Um, and uh, from my side, the connection is already optimized. Okay, so Joe. Joe, it's Graham. That. Hello, Joe. It's Graham. Yeah. Maybe if you switch your video off, that might yep. um, free up the uh, bandwidth a little bit more. Thank you for that. Uh, I will try to do the else. It might keep out of this if that's the case. I'll apologize to the colleagues for leaving you waiting. Okay, well, whilst um, Joe is trying to reset himself, then just to remind you, we have a okay. breakout so, session coming up. Uh, where if you've got any questions on the technical side or on the more operational side, then if you want to go into, there'll be one room for IT specialists and one room for the um, mobility coordinators. And if you choose which one you want to go into, and then you can ask your questions directly to the presenters in that room. So, Joe, how are you doing? All right. Uh, should be back better a little bit now. Uh, yes, much better quality. So far, so good. And, and you're still sharing your screen. All right, brilliant. That's good. Um, so sorry for that. Do you, would you guys want me to go back one or two slides, or shall I just carry on? I don't know how much we could get through. I think Generally, you sorry for the issue with the bandwidth. Go back at least one slide. Very good. So. I'll slide rather quick. And um, thank you for letting me go back because this is actually an important point. What I was saying in this slide is that, um, you know, this links with uh, what Victor mentioned as uh, the first challenge that we encountered, having a well-defined student population. Um, and also as part of the new uh, Erasmus app, um, what has been presented will be the default login of <clears throat> let students into these tools. And so you will, we'll come back to talk about the ILA and the app in the following webinars, but they're kind of around the corner. So um, I, I really encourage all the colleagues to start checking in whether your comments uh, can confirm that your students have, um, have the right credentials, have the right connection to, to be able to make a system. Okay, slides are racing out of me. The second point here uh, was about uh, the once-only principle, the notion that uh, whilst currently it's a bit steady use information by end, um, as we have more automated systems, such as the ones we are proposing, um, some of the things can be pre-filled automatically. This is not so much about saving time, if I'm honest. Um, that would be the case for the careers at universities. But um, it's rather about making sure that information is reliable and it's confirmed. Uh, third use case, so third connection. And here I'm going to use an example from, um, I'm going to use the online learning agreement, is that sometimes students end up in some of these tools, um, and maybe in some cases they shouldn't. So as you know, there's and we are now in the process of local systems, information systems for, of third-party providers and those that are part of the EWP cloud. Um, and what we should be able to do in the near future is that if, for example, a university from a student from a university that does not need to use the online learning agreement because they have their own in now student learning agreement, we should be able to tell them, listen, you're knocking at the wrong door. Please refer to this website, to this platform. And again, this is something we need to have to be able to match the affiliation of the student with a map of who's using each services. So this is a very big piece of the puzzle. Now, a point. This is a little bit more technical. I'm not going to discuss it in detail, but over the last few weeks and months, uh, we've we've been talking with many colleagues that are planning to use, for example, this is a random example, let me be very clear, it's, it's not encouraging to do, but 
Um, someone might want to use the Erasmus dashboard for interinstitutional agreements, um, the, the move on solution of students, uh, maybe the mobility online solution for, for a step of the process, such as uh, issuing transfer records. Currently, this mix and match doesn't come easy. And there will always be compromises because some of the systems have a certain logic built in. But one of the reasons why to, to afford maximum is because of what Victor pointed out earlier. Different systems need to be able to recognize the same student in the same way. And so the more we rely on this kind of approach, the easier it will be for you to configure and to adapt to your specific needs. Should uh, Krem, I think I have to ask you to mute your microphone now. I'm not sure if that's the source of noise, but I sense there is a little bit of background. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so this is something that uh, from a future proofing from an architecture viewpoint, it will be important to make sure that everyone can take maximum advantage of the digitization of the Erasmus program. Now, a fifth example um, is uh, extending this uh, ecosystem, this approach of having common identifiers. Um, one of the things that the colleagues from the European Commission are very kindly looking into is whether in the possible it will be possible it will be possible to align the support system and the mobility tool so that students can also be identified in the same way using the European student identifier. Obviously, the more homogeneous the ecosystem is, the more economies of scale we have, the more efficient processes we can design. This is not an announcement. We are not there yet, but it's something that there's uh, a lot of work and goodwill being put into that, of course, would uh, stand to benefit the entire community. And now I start wrapping up with examples that are a little bit further into the future, but that help us uh, focus our minds uh, somewhat. So, one of the scenarios that uh, we've discussed in several conferences and several workshops with some of you um, would be about uh, the possibility that in the future, when a host university issues a transfer of records, um, and this transfer of records is sent to, EW, to the home university through EWP, that the student could automatically receive a copy of this document. They're also an actor in the process. They should have the ability to be informed in real time. Now, nowadays, you know how this happens. In most cases, it happens because you, you might, if you want to do this, you might want to put the student in CC in case you circulate this information by email or you notify them to fetch this document from your IT system. Um, in the future, we should be able to make this rather more automatic. In the future, there will be no transcripts of records um, circulating by email, presumably, if we stick to the digitization roadmap. And so, essentially, we can make sure that there is a little wallet in the app or in other systems where the students can be a part of these processes. And looking ahead as well, and this is my last example, um, one of the things that is being worked on for 2021 is the possibility for students to apply for their mobilities directly through the Erasmus app. Um, at present, uh, we're not there yet, and for many universities, this will not be something that they need to use because they have very good systems that already handle this possibility. But this could bring us back to uh, the remark that um, Victor made that he illustrated with, if the student enters through one of the cloud components of EWP, how do we make sure that we know where they come from and where they can go to? And so, again, this identifier plays a large role in this ecosystem. Now, I'm already telling you quite a bit about the OLA and about the app. Um, I, I probably should save that for the next uh, webinars where we will go into a little bit more detail on what we can expect and what is being worked on regarding these new solutions. Perhaps I would add that um, later this year, in late September, beginning of October, there will also be a round of workshops uh, carried out in different languages about the European student identifier in greater detail. 
And as Graham mentioned, uh, I think in the chat box, the slides from today will be on the page of the event where it got the links and the coordinates. We will have that updated very shortly indeed. Which kind of concludes my presentation. So if I was to reiterate uh, what we invite you to do is um, get acquainted